Kia ora everyone, my name's Anne Patel and it's my great pleasure to um, introduce Brad Bridges from St Peter's up here in Auckland, engendering a love of mathematics which is what we're all about. Uh, this is part three so if you've missed part one and part two you might want to go back and catch the earlier episodes. Um, Brad was the winner of the Kalman Award and out of that award I think he put together some ideas that we have asked him if he would share with teachers across the motu and he's kindly doing that. Um, I will stop my share and I will hand over to you Brad. All right let me just get my screen up for the presentation and here we go. Okay so you can see that now? Yep, that's all good. All right. And so, um, as Anne said, this is the third presentation. The first presentation I gave, oh, sorry, no, my hair, how am I, everyone? I'm Brad Bridges from St. Peter's. And um, the first presentation I did basically was on the whole junior maths program. It was a real cut through in terms of all the elements and how it all made up. But then uh, obviously, you didn't have time to dive into anything more substantive than that. So my second one was more into the beliefs and attitudes and how you motivate students. And this one here today, I'm going to go into the, the third element. Um, before I start, I'd just like to share a story with you. And then I share most of my workshops that um, I almost failed maths in high school, hard to believe. Um, and I was thinking the other day... Um, about what my first memory of, um, uh, what do you call it? My first memory of maths is. And then, uh, you know, I thought back and I thought it's probably why I started disliking maths right from the start. My first memory was in kindergarten. I was five years old, walked into the Good Shepherd Kindergarten. What a lovely name, right? In, um, in Singapore. And uh, I remember vid vividly once, uh, the teacher was getting me to recite my times table and I couldn't. So I got held back uh, after school and uh, she kept asking me and I couldn't do it. And I got a smack on the, on the palm of my hand for my troubles. And um, so that was, wasn't was bad enough. Uh, this is what she looked like. <laughs> and uh, literally she, she had glasses like that, scared the living daylights out of me. So... So, you know, I guess, what? why am I telling you that? I, I guess I have a good appreciation for what a lot of my um, Akonga feel when they come in about maths, you know, how they hate maths and maths is scary and all the rest of it. And part of my motivation was how can I turn that around to make them love maths and uh, enjoy it. And I will, at the end of this presentation, I'll share with you some, uh, one particular feedback I got that I thought is very uplifting and motivating. Right, so, okay, so the, the three key things, the big picture is if we can engender a love of maths, um, if we can create a positive medical, mathematical mindset and we can develop a good understanding of how uh, maths works um, and how to learn maths and how to have effective study habits, revision and executive process strategies. So all these things taken together um, will empower the student to do well in maths and you know the better they can do in maths the more motivated they'll be in it so that was like the big picture and I thought you know what's driving this thing so I thought I'd share that with you and this year is the graphic that actually represents the whole thing then all the elements that fit together first that's the classroom environment in the, where the students operate then I've changed this a little bit where we have our attitudes and beliefs um, I think it's worth putting the beliefs part in it as well. To me, before the attitude encompassed it, but the belief part is very important if the students believe in their stuff. Uh, I think that's what we, we call self-efficacy. If they believe in themselves, they're going to um, be more motivated. Um, then there's the effort they put in. And then the last one I did, I covered, so how do we get them motivated? So I talked about that as well. So in this... Um, presentation I'm going to focus in on the strategies now I'm not going to delve too much into the actual um, how you teach certain aspects of math strategies because I think we all pretty much got that but you know we do have some uh, some things that we try here but I'm thinking more about the teaching and um, learner strategies that they can use um, outside of just the basic 
um, met. So the first thing we do um, at St. Peter's, and, and this has worked really well, is um, around this time of year, I send an email out to all, all incoming year seven, uh, year eight, so incoming year nines, they're year eights currently, uh, their parents and their students. And I, and I say, look, there's this course here, brilliant course, how to learn maths for students. Uh, it's free. And uh, it was developed by Joe Bola. And I show them the research that shows how much this course, this online course about understanding how to learn maths um, helps. Uh, encourage them. It's not compulsory, but I don't say that. So I say it's expected that you do it. And uh, last year I got a 60% uptake of it. There's an equivalent course for this as well for teachers, how to learn maths for teachers. It's not free. I think it's 149 US when I did it, but I managed to get the school to pay me to do it. And I thought, well, that's, that's really good. So I, I experienced it myself before recommending it for the students. All right, so what does this course cover? It talks about how to gain a positive relationship with maths, growth mindset, how the brain learns, which is very, very important. So, you know, the students understand what it takes for them to retain material and be able to use it. Uh, one of the key messages uh, is to alleviate this fear of making mistakes is they go into how mistakes are really valuable. And, you know, I always tell the story about babies when they learn to walk they keep making mistakes all the time because they keep falling on their butt until they can stand up and not fall. And if we all, you know, acted like we do now, not wanting to make mistakes, we'd all still be crawling on the floor. And uh, that's quite an important one. Um, the other aspect they learn is it's not performance sport and it's not the speed that matters. It's about the depth um, that you get to, the understanding, and it's about learning and not just performing on tests. However, that sometimes is a difficult one because um, our school is very much um, an assessment-driven school. So we sort of balance the, the, the two together. Um, and we say, like I say in my class, it's not about performing and it's not about speed, it's about learning. But then certain parts of the year, we have to do an assessment. And, uh, and that's when you have certain time limits. And then basically I teach them, how do you get speed? you know, what are the strategies you can use to get speed from doing this? And we talk about practice and improvement and stuff like that. So that's the first thing before they even come in. They do this before they start year nine. Uh, we get about, um, like I say, 60%. I'm hoping to get more. This year, I'm only aiming for 80% and above uh, complete this course. It's important because when they come, we then talk to them about, um, the, the aspects in this and we reinforce it in the way we manage our classrooms. Uh, then we also have number flexibility patterns and diagrams. That's the important thing. All right. The next thing is um, last year we, or this year, we, we had a classroom management plan that each of the junior maths teachers did. This was shared with, um, by the way, let me just say all this material is on the website. Uh, you might have to search around a little bit because there's quite a bit there. And the link for it should be sent to you. It's already in, it, it's also at the end of this presentation. So we developed a classroom management plan and this wasn't a discipline plan. It was basically how we're gonna manage our classrooms. And um, the headings, I only put the headings here so that we can look at it. So we have the aim or goal for the year that, that I have and then it encompasses a lot of expectations, um, class procedures, um, classwork and homework expectations, um, you know, what, how much am I going to give? What am I expecting them to do? Classroom expectations and norms. So what sort of culture do we have in our class? What does it look like? So it's written in the things that if you walked in our class, this is what you'd see. Uh, the classroom rules, I'd suggest a maximum of four. I only have one. My one rule is that you can do anything as long as you don't upset anyone. And that's uh, quite a good, easy rule to remember. Um, special features for this class, I have... Um, dead joke Fridays and, um, um, you know, things like that, uh, where the boys come to the front of class and tell tell their favorite dad joke. Obviously, it needs to be a appropriate one. And this management plan at the start of the year is shared with parents and students, and we teach that in year one, each of us. Um, each of us have a similar plan, but, but different and tailored to our individual teaching styles. So that's another element that we use. 
and that's basically you know it's taught you know to probably about the first six weeks of term one before it starts becoming uh, practice in class. Uh, all the students uh, are required to have scientific calculators. We used to have the approach where they we, they didn't use calculators because we thought that created number sense, but it doesn't. Um, the new calculator we're going to uh, recommend this year is the Casio FX8200 AU. That's a really good one, and it's uh, reasonably priced at about 59 and You can get a special deal. You can get it for 50 Not that I get a kickback or anything. <laughs> the boys... Um, the boys, and it is boys in our school, sorry. The, the boys get a booklet, basic arithmetic and calculator booklet. The link to that uh, booklet is also on the website. And basically, there's a focus on them using their calculators and to do fractions, decimals, percentages, bit mass, exponentials, basically as many of the um, arithmetic functions in the calculator as, as, as possible. They learn how to use the tool properly, which... A lot of few of the other departments are um, grateful for the science department, for example, are grateful we teach them how to use their calculators properly because by the time they show them, they know how to do it. And the key thing about all this is that it frees up cognitive space for learning concepts in the student's head. And, you know, th that was our aim going in, but that was actually a student's comment to come back when we did a survey. Uh, what do you think about having a calculator? And it says, fantastic because I don't have to worry too much about the arithmetic. I can focus on what the teacher is teaching and focus on the concept, right? Um, some teachers have said, well, well, then they won't learn, um, you know, they won't learn how to do something and, you know, how to show working, but that's not uh, the case because in the many of our problems, we tell the boys they still must show their understanding by showing their logical steps that they work through. Uh, they can use a calculator to check the answer so that's a little help. If they get the wrong answer, they think, hmm, I did that wrong. I better try that again. But isn't that what learning's about? All right. So that's one of the things. Uh, classroom habits, another key thing. So th this is the sort of thing we we turn on and, and you know, we do. All of us um, have do nows, and I'm sure a lot of you do as well. As the boys walk in the class, there's a do now. But a do now isn't, you know, um, get your book out and get ready. Uh, the do now would be a number talks. Uh, we're gonna start started doing data talks as well. Uh, two things you remember from yesterday, or solve a problem. So there's something that they go in and get engaged. This takes a little while um, to bed down. The boys will walk in, the students will walk in. And then quite often you just need reminders. Don't forget to look at the do now and start your work. But that's one habit, so then they get into the habit. And the interesting thing is we start at year nine, it goes to year 10. I'm the academic dean for year 11s as well, and we're going to flow that on to year 11 this year so that we don't lose the benefit of building that those those good habits. Uh, regular homework, it's 30 to 60 minutes weekly. You know, emails get sent home. And basically, the, the content in the email to parents is that there's no such thing as there's no homework. If there's no assigned homework, there's always revision, writing, SWOT notes, review, problem solving that your child can do. And we expect between 30 and 60 minutes a week. So the best thing is to schedule it. So when we come to another part, we talk about how we get the stu uh, students to plan um, their, their, you know, to write a plan and how they're going to execute a part of it is, you know, their homework schedule. Um, active listening and focus. Um, uh, one of the things uh, I don't know Excuse how often me, Greg, see... can I interrupt yeah. just for a minute? Um, I, I, have you got slides to go with what you're talking about or is it should it just be on the first slide? Oh, is it on the first slide? It is still on the first slide. Oh, dear. Something's happened. Um, um, oh, it says my sharing is paused. No wonder. Why is that? Right, I'm going to stop and start again. Sorry about that. No problem. I just, yeah, just suddenly realized that you're talking to things and, and they're not coming yeah, up. Yeah, no, it is in the slide. I need to... Let me just share again. Yeah, just a second. Okay. Share again. Is Can you see anything? 
Not at not at the moment, Brad. Oh, yeah. That hasn't happened to me before. We've been able to follow you so far. It's all good. I know it's a shocker because the slides, the slides make it. Let me let me do the slide again. Bear with me. And I'm on. How do I maximize? Oh, there we go. Okay, now let me do that shit again. Let's see. What do you see now? Classroom habits, change your habits, yeah, change your life. That's the one. Sorry, Perfect. everyone. Okay. No problem. Now, let me just see. I'll flick down. Can you see the next one to come up? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Yes, sorry about that. All right. So let me just. Okay, so so we I was just talking about do now regular homework. One of the key things um in in um this next one, active listening and focus. And I find it quite often I go to classes and do observations, and I find I was doing it myself until I did a bit more research. Um is how often teachers are teaching and students are listening or, or, or um, focusing. And when you're not listening and focusing, nothing goes in your head. I mean, it's bad enough when you're looking elsewhere and all the rest of it. It's worse when you're not listening and focusing. So we've made it a real point in classroom habits that, and, you know, we're talking amongst the teachers that we don't start teaching until we see um, that the class is all paying attention and focused. And if they if they lose it, we stop, right? Because and that, that's not so much because we want everyone to do it because that is a point, but we also want them to learn that it's important to be focused on what is said and to listen. And it's not like we're talking for the whole time. We spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes maximum and then they do work. But the key thing is that they learn about active listening and focus. So that's a very important point. And we try and get as a habit. Um, we do a lot of mini whiteboard activities at least uh, once a week. We, we try and do that. So that's where, you know, we have mini whiteboards in a group. They work on the problem solving. They solve it as a, as a, as a group. They write the answer up. There's a few benefits on this one. It, it teaches them uh, collaborative uh, learning. They work as a team. Uh, the second thing is um, it, uh, it's really good because everyone has to hold their, their board up and I get to see that everyone is participating and I get to see whether they got um, the process and the answer right. And it's one of my checks for understandings, right, that, that it happens. So, you know, I normally have a mini whiteboard activity to show, um, to test something that we might have covered the previous week or the previous day. That's another activity. Um, I, I don't, um, now I've gone almost 100% to cold calling if I have questions. Um, that's one way to maintain engagement and also to keep the boys uh, focused because they don't know who's going to answer. And I don't. I know we've all been in classes where the same person answers, puts up their hand and answers the questions all the time. So um, I might get out of 100 questions I ask, I might give five where someone can put up their hand. What I do do with cold calling, though, if I cold call on someone and they can't answer, um, I generally don't accept I don't know because um, uh, I want them to try. I said, no, I'd like you to make an effort to, to, you know, if you have to guess, you guess, you have to work something out, I'll give you time, not a problem, but I don't know, it's too easy an answer to just not um, participate. So they give a try and then um, if they're struggling, uh, then I give them a chance to nominate someone else to help them out. So, you know, we ask, is there someone else in class that like to help Johnny out? And uh, that's when another boy might put up the hand and he can say, okay, let's uh, Alistair do that and then Alistair can answer. And then we have a discussion. That seems to work quite well and as a habit. So there's no calling out. There's no, um, mostly not putting up hands. Um, there's a lot of questioning, uh, thinking in class discussions. Um, uh, it's a habit in class as well in the class. Um, not only for me to the class, but the boys back to me as well. So we have that 
uh, you know, that interaction going. And we do quite a bit of think pair share, especially with a number of talks. Sometimes I say, okay, here it might be a bigger problem. I said, okay, now think as individuals, pair with your uh, with your partner, the answer you're going, come up with a solution that you think is the correct thing, you share it with the rest of the class, then I'll call on them as well. So that goes with the mini whiteboard activity. Um, one of the things that the class uh, habits is very important, and I try and um, make sure that's the case and the boys understand is that we have a safe classroom and that we don't laugh at um, boys that try and make uh, mistakes or boys that, um, you know, students that make an effort um, and that it's safe for everyone to do that. And I get quite a lot of feedback from the boys that they, they feel that's definitely the case and definitely a positive thing for the class. So it's very, very important that we maintain that safe classroom. So that's the habit part of it. And then there's the other thing we, we teach and this we started doing more this year. And this is basically, you know, in terms of we have the PPDAC cycle, which is absolutely brilliant. And we're doing a lot more teaching that in year nine and 10. We haven't in the past because we've been more focused on pure maths rather than stats, but we're doing more. But we also now starting to teach the boys this process, you know, which um, I put together based on Polia's problem solving approach to mathematical inquiry cycle. And I went to that workshop recently and one of the speakers was talking about that. And I thought, huh, that's interesting. And what we teach the boys, basically, um, the students is basically, uh, we, we teach them explicitly, give them a word problem, like maybe quite a big, um, like um, year 11 numerical methods type problem. And we say, okay, let's let's work through that with the uh, through this cycle. Uh, and first, they prepare themselves to say, you know, um, am I ready to do this? Um, and then they understand what the problem is, what information has been given, the process is uh, explained. Um, how do I plan to solve it? I did an exercise with my year 10s the other day, which I really, really like. I gave them a practice assessment. I said, let's understand what information we have, what we have, uh, what, what we have to answer. And then I got them all to write a plan. And their plan was basically, how would you go about solving this problem? What would be the first step you do, second step? And they all wrote it out step by step. And, and uh, it was, it was, I was very impressed with the results. And then basically the next step was, okay, you know, I want you to do the first four steps that you've highlighted and then we'll do a check-in, right? And then you reflect, how do you think that gone, uh, how reflect on their process they use, their planning, and also reflect on this whole inquiry cycle. And they loved it. They thought it was really good. There's a lot of thinking out loud stuff, you know, when I'm modeling. And then you expect the students to do the same. I find that this, I think this can be especially useful for new level one maths. And that's why we started teaching it in uh, in 10, year 10. And next year when they go in, it will just keep building on it, right? So that's another thing we've introduced. Number talks, data talks, uh, safe, effective process. Um, and, and there's uh, more information about it in, in, um, the, the website, I've got summaries there about it. Uh, data Talks, you, you know, there's a website called YouTube. I think a lot of us have heard about it. A lot of um, information there about it. We focus mostly on number talks this year. We're just starting to introduce Data Talks. And that's basically a similar concept, number talks. We put a little problem on board. Uh, the boys do it, the students do it um, uh, mentally and they put a thumb in front of them when, they're, when they've got an answer, they put a thumb in the first finger, they got two ways of doing it. And then we call out who's prepared to share the answer Then we talk about how you achieve that. So everyone learns from it. Data talks a little bit different in that um, we, you know, project a, an image up, which says, what is this, what is this chart showing you? And there's some really, really interesting stuff. And, you know, the students come up with stuff that I wouldn't have even thought about sometimes, which is, and then it generates a really interesting discussion and a really interesting um, thinking statistically. And I quite enjoy those. All right. So it's meant to create number sense, number flexibility, statistical thinking, uh, observation. We usually do it as a do now activity, maybe five to 10 minutes. Sometimes it might take a bit longer, depends, sometimes shorter. 
And um, part of it as well is this thing, we can use number talks for retrieval practice and space practice. And I'm gonna to come to that, that's part of the science of learning. The aim for us is about two times a week. Coming close to uh, critical times a year, I might do it more often, but uh, generally throughout the year is about two times a week. So that's what another thing that we do. Now here's one of the uh, foundation blocks for what we do, what we teach St. Peter's, the science of learning. There's, um, there's actually um, a term now, science of learning. If you Google it, you'll find lots and lots of stuff. This graphic here basically um, uh, encapsulates it that, you know, we get encoding. That's where you pay attention. You get encoding, message, uh, what you call it, information going into the brain. And then, the, you know, part of the learning is, is getting into long-term memory and being able to recall it and use it. And then part of that process, sometimes you forget, but that's not always a bad thing because um, forgetting gives you an opportunity to relearn stuff, right? And then there's the definition of working memory and long-term memory and how you go from stuff being in working memory into long-term memory. So one of the, the, the key messages, the retrieval practice is, you know, a lot of times, you know, um, in my own past is like, I need to get this stuff into the, into the students' heads. And what I, I've learned now is it's really not about getting the stuff into the heads, it's being able to get the stuff out again so they can use it. And that's what retrieval practice is about. So a lot of my practice is about, you know, what's two things you learned yesterday, right? Think about it, share with your buddy, come and tell me, and then we'll go around the room and see whether we get everything up, um, how we recall. So we do a lot of retrieval practice. I do brain dumps uh, with a class, you know, they might get a blank sheet of paper, with um, some heading questions and they have to write down everything they can remember. And that helps reinforce their learning and what's um, in their memory. Space practice is about um, having gaps between doing things. So if they learn, um, for example, um, simultaneous equations, then I might leave it a couple of weeks and then we'll do simultaneous equation as a do now activity. And then suddenly they have to, oh, how do we do that again? And they recall and do it and it locks it into memory again and it, it deepens the learning. Uh, interleaving is basically mixing topics up, not doing it in blocks. And the worst thing is, is the books normally are in blocks. So we do teach them in blocks because it's effective to learn the skill. But once they learn the skill, we assess them um, with interleave work. So I normally give them you know, worksheets that are mixed problems in it. So they have to not learn one concept and just keep applying the same concept over and over again. They have to change and think, oh, how do I solve this one? How do I solve that one? And that's interleaving. Elaboration, I get them quite often. I'll send an email home. Um, ask Sam this evening to explain to you about um, whatever topic, right? And then they have to go back and explain to their sister or their parents or whatever, what they learned in their own words. So that's elaboration. They can write it down, they can explain it. They do that in class sometimes. And that's when if they put it in their own words, basically the, the learning is deepened as well and they show their understanding. If they can't explain it at all, then obviously there's a problem there or you know something that needs work. Um, they, get, they get write summary notes uh, with really concrete examples. And that's important. So they have good examples. Uh, not just whatever comes up with by examples, they actually show them the method and the way they write it out. So there's something they can refer to. And um, the other thing I've done this year, it's not in or dual coding is where they use words and images as well. So they draw pictures. I get them to draw pictures a lot in maths. Um, the other thing I did this year as well, there's, um, there's um, um, a site brain, brainscape was, um, that I use a login. A website that allows me to do free flashcards, and I've got like 100 flashcards uh, for the students to use. And you know, where they just practice, they go and practice, and the flashcard will ask for something, they'll have to give an answer and they record themselves. And that's part of the retrieval practice, but it's also prepping them to make sure that they can recall the stuff they need to recall. Spend a bit of time on that one. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of material on the website on that too. Um, so the techniques that the boys 
views. I've, I've talked a bit about this. I just want to reiterate uh, two th things. Think, pair, share for recall practice, brain dumps, guided brain dumps is where I put questions in. Lots of quizzes. I do Blue Kit, which is uh, quite a good one. They enjoy that because it's gamified. A lot of mini tests and uh, low stakes. Uh, mini whiteboard group activities, weekly worksheets, um, homework. So we got a homework book. And the parents actually asked for that. So that was interesting. We got a homework book and a, and a textbook, spaced and interleaved, number talks, data talks, elaborations, whatnot. So I've covered quite a few of these things. So those are a lot of the learning techniques. And the thing about it is we teach it um, to, the, to the, the students, but we also, you know, get them to do it themselves, right? So that they can develop their own brain dumps. They can do their own you know, on your way home today on the bus, uh, repeat what you learned and see whether you can recall that. I can't hear you, Anne. Oh, no problem. No problem, Brad. No, don't, sorry, I was talking to my daughter. Oh, okay, sorry. Right. Um, so the other thing we do, I'm just um, going through this, is we teach the kids, oh, the kids, the, boy, <laughs> the students, how to study and revise maths. Goal setting and scheduling their work uh, creating an environment where they can study, uh, getting rid of distraction. There are even apps they can use on their phones to cut any all the distractions out for a period of time. So we show them where they can go and do that. Um, the importance of good sleep, nutrition, and exercise. Um, what to focus on in terms of their learning. So metacognition, where to prioritize, where to find, um, where to find uh, resources and help. The Pomodoro technique is um, anti procrastinating tool. It's basically um, a way of teaching them how to focus for a short period of time, do solid work, and then have breaks. Uh, and there's an app for that as well. How to use the science and learning. And then um, the other thing that they do, which is the metacognitive part, is to reflect on, on tests and exam results and come up with um, thinking about what else, what they might have to change. All right? So metacognition it's thinking about thinking how they operate their planning um what what to do differently so give them awareness um, of what's going on and how to take action uh, reflect on their progress and the strategies they used or didn't use and and what worked and what didn't work and um you know so we talk a lot of this is through discussion it's not like a lesson it's um throughout each of the work that, uh, the, the throughout the year we just at certain times when the opportunity comes up, we, we cover these things, all right? So we have our first test and we usually make it a little bit tougher than we'd like so that, you know, they, they get a little bit of that fright and if they don't do as well, they're not overconfident and then they reflect on it. So, okay, this is what I need to do differently. So that helps. It's all a bit of strategy there. How to think when doing, when solving math problems, what are the, you know, like the polia problem solving method, or what do I do when I study? How to think when I'm sitting at test or exam? I'll come to that as well in a bit more detail. How to control my emotions, especially when they're anxiety, when they're anxious, and things are happening. What they can do about positive talk and, and controlling of their behavior. So there's, there's, you know, this isn't taught as a lesson explicitly, but it's taught by modeling and discussion and as, uh, along the way, right? And that's where it suits it best. Uh, executive function process, a bit like metacognition, goal setting, organizing, holding, manipulating information, working, Mary, that's an important one for them. So a lot of how that works, the different types of thinking that can occur. And sometimes, you know, it's all right for them to look up and stay out in the space because their mind's processing work. It's not that they're distracted and they understand that. Uh, the key one in that is reflecting and self-monitoring, which is important. So you teach them to be self-managed um, and emotional self-regulation. And this, once again, is not taught as a, as a lesson per se. It's used throughout, you know, when the opportunities arise. How to sit tests and examination. You look at that picture on the right, that's, uh, that's my year 12s and 13s in a nutshell. Right, uh, muck around the whole <laughs> or has been the history. Study for three nights before the exam, and then try and do the best that they can. And I'm trying to break that cycle. Right, that's um, that's something that's been um, frustrating as, as 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 hell. So we teach the boys right explicitly early in the year 
how to sit tests and examinations, how to prepare the mindset that they need, physical needs, you know, the sleep, the hydration, uh, how to deal with anxiety. I'll come to that shortly. Where to find their resources, how to help themselves, what they can do, strategies to use when testing them, and then learning from mistakes. So we spend quite a bit of time reiterating this so that they improve their method. We start year nine, we reinforce in year 10, and I'll have my first batch of year 11s next year. And, you know, hopefully I'll be able to tell you um, how much improvement <laughs> it made. Right, but I I fully believe that it'll be um, a virtuous cycle next year. We'll have much better prepared students. Dealing with test anxiety, um, we work on you know uh, positive self talk, uh, developing uh, belief in oneself, um, proper preparation, and what the boys can you know what the students can do. Uh, square breathing is an important one. That's actually been shown by research to help quite a bit and. Um, if you don't know what it is, just do a quick Google on square breathing. It's like you breathe in for four seconds, hold for four seconds, breathe out for four seconds, hold for four seconds, and you repeat. And it really calms you down. The importance of sleep, good sleep, um, exercise, and water. And um, basically, uh, the main thing that causes the anxiety is forgetting stuff. So we spend a lot of time on retrieval practice. And the more they can recall stuff and the strategies they can use for doing that, the better they are prepared and the more confident they are and the less anxious they are, right? So there's a lot of different angles to that. Right, that was quite a quick run, two forty minutes. I just want to end with what I consider a bit of an uplifting, maybe a motivating uh, feedback from a parent and a student. And I want to share that with you. I'm just going to show it and you can read it. Um, a couple of slides. I'll let you read the first one and I'll show this. One. This comes from a, a Maori student I've been teaching for two years now. This is the second year, he's in year 10. Um, he, he has um, a, a percentile processing speed at 8%. You can imagine how tough that is uh, in a math thing. He came to me in year nine totally, totally um, out of depth in terms of what to do in maths, right? Uh, and I'll let you read the stuff. And you know, it's th this is the kind of things that uh, keeps me going every day. Right. Yeah, so I, I got that, I got that uh, recently and I thought, wow, well, fantastic. Now, that's the end of it. I have a website you can go to, download anything you like. Um, you don't see something there that you like, just let me know, drop um, drop me an email. And, um, and if there's any questions that pop up, I'll be happy to answer them.